Yeah, the cool thing about Bitcoin is there's no country behind it. There's no peg. There's no world reserve. I mean, if people can, some people that are really into the space consider it as like the world reserve currency because it truly is like decentralized, right? And what happened is like there's, you know, there's the US dollar is one thesis. The US dollar is decreasing over the last uh, couple of years, uh, either because of the pandemic, either because we're printing a lot of money or, you know, uh, creating debt. Um, but really, that's just one thesis, right? In, in reality, other countries all have access to Bitcoin. And especially in high inflation countries, uh, people flee to Bitcoin because you, all you need is a web, you know, website or an internet and you're able to get Bitcoin, right? So people are just like dumping money into Bitcoin. And that's one thesis is like, it's a hedge against the dollar. Um, of course, in my opinion, I think there's another thesis where there's innovation on the blockchain space. And that's also driving what's going on with Bitcoin as well. So from a you know, simple answer, you could say that Bitcoin is indeed a hedge against inflation um, because it, there's no dependency on any other currency and it's a fixed supply, right? Um, but the other thesis is like where the technology is applicable in the real world. Great, that, that makes total sense. And Andy, similar question to you. Um, we've seen the stock market hit all time highs. And so I guess I'm curious, is that what Robert would say because of the inflation? Or is there um, greater value in the stocks themselves? What's what's going on in the stock world? Well, I think um, I think I'd back up a little bit for this conversation and talk about the difference between the investments first and what they are. I think the the wrong way to approach this for a new student would be to say, "Here's my asset classes. I have real estate. I have business. I have stocks. I have commodities. I have cryptos." which is best. And I think that's a really big mistake because they actually do different things. Um, I have all of those things, every single one of them. But as I look at my financial statement, the purpose behind which I'm buying them is much, much different. So let me give you an example and I'll start with gold. Um, gold is, uh, is something that I have. And when I buy it, I don't trade it. In other words, I'm not really excited about the idea of trying to look at a chart, perform some kind of technical analysis, uh, rely on global fundamentals uh, for fundamental analysis, uh, you know, considering currencies and, and their possible devaluation to try to buy gold low, uh, gold low and sell high. That's not, uh, trading gold to me doesn't make any sense. Um, Gold to me is exactly what Robert says. It's a way to put wealth in something other than a dollar if I feel the dollar is at risk. And so, you know, gold doesn't make anything. It doesn't produce anything. It doesn't, uh, it just sits there, right? You could use it as somewhat of a consumable, I suppose, but it's a commodity. A stock is much different. A stock is a business where it produces cash flow. Does that make sense? Um, you know, gold will never pay a dividend. I can't have gold go up and down and up and down and up and down in price, but also pay me a dividend because it doesn't make anything. So I don't like to favor stocks over real estate or Bitcoin or anything else. I just think they're different vehicles. And I would also caution people to be warned of dogma. You know, I'm not a stock advocate. That's really important to understand. I'm an educator. I don't advocate for people to get in stocks because my logic and my experience tells me that there are weaknesses in stocks as an investment. There's weaknesses in gold as an investment. There's weaknesses in Bitcoin as an investment. There's weaknesses in business and real estate. Every single one of these has things about them that a person would need to know. And there's a quote that I just love from Steve Jobs that I keep on my wall. It's down right now because I was painting. But it says, don't be trapped by dogma. Don't let someone's promotion of an asset uh, be dogmatic and say, well, this is good because I say it is and it's the best one. Be very careful. I never bash an asset class because I can find people who have made millions in gold and lost millions in gold. I can find people that have made millions in Bitcoin and lost in cryptos. I can find you lots of people who have made millions in stocks and lost. So to, to believe that your success is a function of the asset class is false. 
your success will be the function of the investor. In other words, Buffett wasn't made by stocks. Buffett was made by Buffett. It makes sense. Robert wasn't made by real estate. It isn't real estate that made him rich. Robert made him rich. So I think success is a function of the investor's discipline, temperament, and education rather than what asset class uh, they choose. So I would frame this conversation, first of all, is, is if you say which is better, real estate or crypto or business or stocks, I think we're already in a context for failure. Um, a person has to be very smart and realize there are weaknesses to all of these assets, risks to all of these assets, and your ability to manage those risks um, is more education-driven than advice-driven. Advice is go buy gold, go buy Bitcoin, buy, buy stocks. That's advice. But education is here are the challenges with Bitcoin, here's the challenges with gold, here's the challenges with stocks. And, uh, and that's how I'd frame the conversation. At least that's the way I feel about it. Well, then, Andy, do you want to uh, list maybe some of the benefits to the stock market investing and maybe some of the, the dangers well, I, of it? And I'd then almost we'll like to Jeff start with the, the disadvantages. Thing. All right, let's do that. <laughs> Um, one of the problems with um, stocks is they can become detached from fundamentals very, very quickly. And what I mean by that is if you were to look at the S&P 500 as a box that cranks out cash, that produces cash, not in terms of capital gain of its prices going up down, which is the context of most gold and Bitcoin guys. They're like, okay, the price of Bitcoin will go up or the price of gold will go up. That is not the thinking of a stock investor. I'm going to buy this box. The price of the box may go up and down, but how much dividend and do they divide these earnings out? So we have this thing called a price to earnings ratio. Okay, I don't think gold has a price to earnings ratio because it has a price, but no earnings. So if you look at, at, at uh, the S&P 500, traditionally since 1875, 1880, uh, the mean has been about $16 of price will get you a dollar of earnings in the S&P. You know, it's a Schiller weighted, you know, PE index. Today it's at 37. So where traditionally we pay $16 to buy a box that'll produce a dollar. Now we're paying $37 for the same box that produces a dollar. And there's only been one time in the last hundred years where that's happened. And that's the bubble of the dot-com tech bubble where they weren't earning any money. So you're just paying price for companies that were vaporware. So I think that's a real big risk is a person needs to understand there can be a vast attachment from fundamentals. A good example is GameStop and all the Reddit foolishness there is they say, well, these guys are in a short squeeze, let's buy it. But fundamentally, um, that company's not worth $39 billion of market cap. Um, if you took all of GameStop's assets and sold them and paid off the liabilities, you'd wind up with about $400 million. So it's tough to have a $39 billion market cap on a company with a balance sheet's worth, you know, their, their book value is, is $400 million. So that detachment from fundamentals uh, can happen and it happens in gold and it happens in Bitcoin because a frenzy happens and it's based on supply and demand of, of the item rather than the underlying, you know, value or production of that. So that'd be a big warning I'd give people uh, to go short. What I like about stocks, and I'm and, and Bitcoin's coming along with this, and, and it, it's not the best place to be right now in terms of puts and calls because they're not on, they're very widespread, it's very risky, it's it's in its infancy still. But the thing I love about stocks is I can use options to hedge risk. With gold, um, you know, if I buy the physical gold, you gotta decide whether to buy or sell it. That's why I just buy and hold it. Same with my Bitcoin. I buy and hold my Bitcoin. Someday you'll have some derivatives. Um, right now there's GBTC. I bought a bunch of that about 17. It's, you know, just, it's like a hundredth of a Bitcoin. But someday that will be optionable and I'll be able to use my risk management strategies and also my cash flow strategies in the paper asset derivative of crypto. But it's still traded over the counter. It's still not uh, established yet because it's in its embassy, but it'll get there. Why did I buy it now? Well, if I decide I want to sell calls on that uh, derivative of crypto later, I want a cost basis of $17, not 50 or 100 or 300. So it's a big conversation, but uh, 
you know, when you're buying a stock, you're buying a company. Why does Warren Buffett like, like companies more than perhaps gold? Well, because gold doesn't produce. Uh, Apple, Tesla, you know, technology companies, pharmaceuticals, they produce things and you're always going to beat gold. You're going to beat gold every time cash flow wise because you're producing stuff. But you can't beat gold very often as a hedge, and, and it'd be difficult for crypto. So uh, 